Welcome to Grace at the Fray, a podcast that explores the many dimensions of God's grace that we find at the frayed edges of life. Come explore how God's grace works to renew your life and send you on mission in His kingdom. Hello, beloved. Welcome to Grace at the Fray. So I live in Philadelphia, a very ethnically and culturally diverse place. And I got to tell you, one thing that brings all of these folks together is Philadelphia sports. On Sunday afternoons in autumn, Eagles football gathers people from every tongue and tribe and nation. And they gather at the, the largest temple in the city, Lincoln Financial Field, and if they don't have tickets, they, they camp outside the temple. The parking spots are more expensive the closer you get to the temple. Or maybe they live stream the worship service from their homes or gather in smaller worship venues called bars uh, where the sacraments of beer and wings are served as people participate in a community-building, love-shaping, identity-forming, liturgical practice called football. Now, you, you may think that this is crazy, but it's a real thing. Sports is actually about worship, and the rituals around our sports team shape our love for that team. For me, it's, uh, it's Oklahoma football. A true confession, my wife has called me out many a Saturday evening, the night before I go lead worship at a church, uh, for we'll call it uh, becoming too emotionally and spiritually invested in my team winning or all too often losing. I love Oklahoma football because I went to the University of Oklahoma and participated in the rituals and liturgies that shaped my love and devotion for that team. Maybe it's another team or another sport for you, uh, whatever it may be. There are liturgies that shape your love, things you do and participate in to make you a worshiper where even your identity is wrapped up in the fate of that team or organization. And there's a certain kind of camaraderie with those folks who share the same love. When the team wins, you all win. When the team loses, you all lose. You are united, brought together by love. Well, my guest today, Jamal Williams, co-wrote with Pastor Timothy Paul Jones a fantastic book called In Church As It Is In Heaven, Cultivating a Multi-Ethnic Kingdom Culture. And it offers a different Sunday liturgy a cosmically more significant Sunday liturgy, one that invites people from every tongue, tribe, and nation to gather around the risen King Jesus and to practice our eternal destiny to be an ethnically diverse church brought together by infinite love, to participate in Sunday rituals that teach them and empower them to love as Jesus loves, and to do something remarkable, to love one another. Jamal is the lead pastor at Sojourn Church Midtown in Louisville, Kentucky, and the president of the Harbor Network of Churches, an association of churches that has been launching new churches and developing ministry leaders since 2011. He and his church have been practicing multi-ethnic worship that reflects their local culture. But the beautiful thing is, it's starting to reflect kingdom culture, and he wants every church to start looking more like God's kingdom in church as it is in heaven. And I really appreciated getting to hear his story and to hear the encouragement that he offers to everyone endeavoring to make their church look a little more like heaven on earth. So if you want your church community to reflect the ethnic diversity of your broader community, it all starts with what your worship service looks like on a Sunday morning. And it it actually revolves around a passage from Revelation 7. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. Hey, Jamal. Welcome. Welcome to Grace at the Fray. Thank you. Uh, we did it. We had some technical difficulties, having. but but we did it. Yes, we did. We did. The Lord worked it out, and prayerfully He'll continue to do so. so yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so the renewal team, we've been working through your book, and it's 
I, I love your book. And I, there are all sorts of pastors and, uh, and church folk that I plan on recommending this book to like, seriously. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so I'm looking forward to hearing you unpack some of the book that, that you have and, you know, m- maybe some of your hope for, for what it means to do, to do church in uh, a multi-ethnic way in multi-ethnic community, you know, so full, full disclosure, like full confession. When we decided to read your book, I, I was like, oh man, I'm really discouraged about this topic. And, and then when I, when we got you on the schedule to be on the podcast, I texted a bunch of my pastor friends who are doing a uh, multi-ethnic church plants and revitalization stuff and have just been in that world. And I was like, Hey, what would you ask Jamal uh, if you got to sit with him? And so it was, it's been a a very fruitful kind of conversation with a bunch of my friends and they're all kind of like couching it in the sense of dude, it's hard, you know? Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say that they're discouraged, but I, I'm just like, I don't know. Are you an optimist? Cause I'm, I'm more of a pessimist. And so (laughs) my, Hope is that maybe you can give me some more hope <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> after uh, ab- ab- about this because yeah, just brutal honesty. Yeah. Uh, this is overwhelming yeah. for me. So yeah. so help me help help me bring some hope into but, this. But yeah yeah. So tell me your story and and we'll go from there. Well, Jim, thank you for having me on, and I'm just really humbled that uh, you would read my book and uh, recommend it to others, and really grateful. The conversation around the book is 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 bringing a, a little bit more hope, and that it had a hopeful tone. Uh, I'm still processing. It'll take me a while to process that question. Am I an optimist or do I lean towards discouragement? Uh, I'm kind of both, you know. But the good news is, is that both you and I are currently a part of uh, the multi-ethnic church, which is Christ's body. And one day, whether or not we get to really experience the joy of that here on earth, uh, we will in heaven together. So that's the good news. The good news is it end, yeah. it ends well. <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah, it ends well. So, um, And honestly, in writing and even in trying to live this out, I try to remind myself of that because I know uh, what's coming, that God's kingdom will be fully realized. And one day we will stand around the throne of Jesus with the people from every nation, tribe and tongue. It really takes the pressure to perform off Mm. and the pressure to get it right off. And it frees me and it frees us to just uh, enjoy people and what's good, true and beautiful out of people's culture. So so my story um, in a nutshell, is I am uh, born and raised in Chicago in the Chicagoland area. My parents were church planters right there in the heart of uh, the south side of Chicago. And uh, so I grew up with church planting parents, and uh, the gospel really took root in my heart and life. When I was 10 years old, um, I believe I I experienced new birth, and it was really uh, pretty amazing. Uh, My parents' marriage was on the rocks, and um, they were kind of constantly splitting, were verbally pretty violent towards each other. Hmm. And uh, the gospel took root in my father's heart, and I remember the day that the Lord saved him Hmm. and him coming home from work and saying, the Lord saved him, and uh, things are going to be different. And it was supernatural. I mean, I had never seen someone make a 180 like that. Wow. And he just set the temperature of our household. And my mom, I believe, was already, I believe we went to church every Sunday. In fact, my father's like the deacon in training, you know, before. And he just didn't have that personal renewal, knew the Bible inside and out. And about three months later, I saw them get into their first kind of bad argument on a way to a Bible study. <laughs> and I saw my father. Um, just watching him. And he was actually leading a Bible study that night with some family. It was at my grandmother's house. And and I saw him open up and repent to my mother in tears. Total and surprise. I said, what is ha-? Total surprise. I said, what is happening? Wow. And I sat on the floor and watched him and my mother reconcile in front of everyone. And he articulated in that Bible study lesson, just the gospel. And I said, if this Jesus changed my father, and if this good news is what has taken root in my household, um, I want to know him myself. 
And I feel like the Lord made me alive. So from there, uh, long story short, uh, began to walk with Jesus, went to Michigan State University where I went, met my wife, Amber. Uh, we have five kids ranging from 10 to two six-year-olds um, from Michigan State, moved to Louisville to uh, go to seminary and pastored by accident kind of uh, a church called Forest Baptist Church, which is a 150-year-old historic African-American church. Did that for 10 years, eight years as a lead pastor. Absolutely loved it. It was a revitalization kind of effort, uh, but God breathed life into it. My wife and I loved it. And then in 2016, uh, to our surprise, the Lord called us to a majority white, 99% uh, white at the time, church uh, in the same city. And uh, when the church pursued us, we brought our leadership team in. It was a six month transition. Our church actually kind of sent us as missionaries from this historic African-American church to this predominantly white church that was in a majority black area. I didn't realize and, that. Uh, so there was a sending yeah. as a missionary. There was a sending. That I love Essentially, that. yeah. I, lo- I didn't realize yeah. that. You know, I didn't know if it was like a, yeah. hey, this this yeah. church is flirting with you. and But there's it's also yeah. this like, no – we want to send you to be <laughs> with our blessing to be a blessing. That's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, they, they blessed us on a way out. It was hard. I mean, some, some relationships definitely were strained and some people uh, didn't. Well, really okay. Yeah. I guess that's majority why of the church. Yeah. 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 Majority yeah, of the church, our church, our church. Yeah. The majority of our church and our elders, you know, because we brought them in, uh, we told them six months before, brought them in, asked our elders to discern. They discerned with me, talked to mentors. They were like, hey, man, we feel this call on you and Amber's life. We see this multicultural call. And you. I was consulting with that church for years, and it just kind of made sense to them. And it was really painful, but told our church, and the church uh, allowed me to stay and help them uh, kind of with the process of finding the next pastor, pretty much. And yeah, then they, they sent us off, man. And it's been a, uh, it's been sweet agonis, you know, sweet agony. It's yeah. been a, uh, joy. Uh, but it's also been a, a burden that we've, uh, feel called to. Yeah. It's not surprising that that would be difficult, you know, uh, going from a historically black church to a, a very 99% white uh, mm-hmm. church. So talk about some of the difficulties of that. Uh, you you gave your testimony at the Kinship Conference uh, yes. a while back, and I got a chance to listen to that. And it was profound. And I have a lot of respect for the way that you had to lean into Jesus. And the, and I, w- I want you to tell the story of how you, how Jesus mm-hmm. gave you the, the, the aha moment where mm-hmm. it's just like, he freed you to do this kind of ministry and, you know, and, and it's like for the rest of your life, you're going to be practicing what it means to live into that kind of yeah. grace, you know, but, but yeah, talk yes. about that. Yes. Yeah. So I came into uh, Sojourn in 2016 and, you know, was not quite prepared for just the adjustment of pastoring a historic uh, black church and coming into a, a large white church. And it was really just identity um uh, shaking for me uh you know you just go and we're it's 2016 there's a lot of political unrest <laughs> gotcha. uh, you know mm-hmm. we didn't really come out pressing into ethnic issues and racial issues as as heavy uh but even when we just will lightly mention it i just wasn't prepared for the emails and i need to meet with you and you're not preaching the gospel or all you talk about is race. And so it was just kind of a, a shaking for me. And over time, I realized that uh, for some people who had just never sat under an African-American preaching, almost every Sunday it was about race, even though I wasn't mentioning it. Right. right. There was something culturally that um, is unspoken that's taking place. So it's two, two years of that, uh, trying mm-hmm. to find my voice in that setting as a preacher but as a black creature, as a pastor, but as a black pastor in a majority white space. Yeah. So basically an event happens. I won't go into all the details for the podcast, but an event happens where I show up to it and it's uh, kind of the who's who of uh, in our circles of Christians and pastors and theologians in the city. And there's all the black pastors on one side 
and there's all the white pastors on another side. And it just and naturally some of the did black, that. It just kind of naturally did that. Yeah. Uh, because people were just talking to who they knew. So right. black and pastors, lots of no black pastors. Yeah. White pastors, no white pastors, professors. And there was some, obviously, uh, mixture and mixing in that. But to me, it just felt like this great divide. And I'm there and I'm thinking... Uh, for my black pastor's friends, some of them close to uh, I see right away. And I'm like, oh, that's my brother. But many of them, that relationship was kind of ruptured when I left uh, to go to a, a white church. And I understand that, especially now looking back to it more like these black pastors, like, hey, here's a young black pastor of an all white, historic, well-known church in our city who is leaving for all white white church and uh sell out it could be disorienting yeah sell out maybe he's leaving for more money maybe it's this maybe it's that maybe he's forgot where he's come from everything was going great at force uh shouldn't say everything but things were going really well and so that was disorienting for them and then you have white pastors professors who i'm not pastoring a predominantly white church that's really well known in our city uh, but I'm still a black pastor and I'm pressing into ethnic issues. And for some of them, that makes them uncomfortable. And maybe I'm talking about that a little too much. So I feel like I just didn't have a home. Hmm. And long story short, through that uh, service and through that time of being with them, I just had this existential crisis and it was just exaggerated to the 10th degree. And I just felt like I just did not have a home. And I felt as if the Lord really spoke to me and said, hey, if you don't root your identity in me and in your belovedness and in my gospel. Uh, No one will ever know the true you Hmm. and you will constantly be shifting uh, and and living for people's approval. And it's very few times in my life where I just felt like the Holy Spirit impressed something upon my heart to the point that it was undeniably him. And that day, it's like a gospel bomb went in my heart, off in my heart. And I remember the next day, Sunday, going to preach and everyone was like, what? It was like, I felt like it was the first time I authentically preached as Jamal. Huh. And uh, even in a black setting where it was like, I'm not preaching for the approval of people. I'm actually ministering from a deep sense of like, God loves me. Yeah. Um, as I am. And has created me with this unique story as I am. And it's on other people to um, accept that, not on me to try to gain their approval. And uh, I wish I could say that it's been that strong, that the belovedness and that living out of my adoption, um, it teeters. But there is now a a focal point in which I could say when things are off, um, you know, I'm not living out of that identity. Uh, there also was an article around a time that I discovered by Corey Edwards called A Strange Pioneers, in which she mm-hmm. does a qualitative study um, of Black pastors and Asian um, American pastors in predominantly white spaces. And she basically gets, I want to say it's over like 120 uh, people who fit this category and just shows and organizes the research. And basically what she showed was uh, persons who are in this space, the best um, way to describe them is they're strange. They're strange from their first culture. Many of them, like me, were kind of rejected because they're now in a white space. But they're also pioneers. They have this call for whatever reason to pastor the people that God has put before them. And reading other black and brown leaders in their own words, describe the internal turmoil that I was experiencing. Also, it was like, man, I'm not an anomaly. And then it began to give me a framework for how to build myself up in the gospel, uh, mm-hmm. to be fully who I am as a Christian, uh, but as a Black man who has very specific experiences here in America as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that story because you you found yourself straddling a fence and it's it's not comfortable <laughs> to straddle a fence you know you could go on one side or you could go on the other side but it's like a f- you're straddling the fence because you don't want to go on one side or the other side you know and so that uncomfortable situation jesus goes hey you want to pick a side and you go no and he goes neither do i and so he knocks the fence down you know 
That's right. And suddenly, right. suddenly Jamal's preaching as Jamal, you know, spirit, yes. the spirit moves through you because you yes. were created to be moved through in that, in yes. that kind of way, you know, uh, different from the way that spirit moves through me, different th than the way the spirit moves th through anybody else. And so, yeah, I love that story of how Jesus goes, Hey, right. go be you. And you go, am That's I allowed? Right. And you're like, in, <laughs> in, Christ, right. in Christ, in yeah, Christ, yeah. you go be you. You know, yes, yeah, that's so good. yes, yes, yeah. I appreciate that, and the Lord, Lord was gracious to meet me there, and it's been a journey. You know, uh, I'm still on that journey, but it's something I don't think about nearly as much as I did before, and I do feel that freedom to just just be me. So yeah, yeah, that's so awesome. And then, so I was reading, I was reading your book in 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 church as it is in heaven about how you came to write the book. And the irony of when you're at Forest Baptist, you go, you go give some lectures at this, just some church <laughs> and yes, come to, and yes. someone's like, Hey, you should turn that into a book. And now come to find yes. out the Lord and his sense of humor. He's got, uh, he, he calls you to that church. He calls you to sojourn mid, uh, midtown. And, yes. and now it's suddenly a book. So, so talk to me about how, yes. how this stuff become a book. Yeah, man, that's that's thanks for bringing that up. I mean, that's over 10 years ago. You know, I'm just doing a talk at Sojourn as they uh, uh, just bought a new building uh, literally down the tracks, uh, down the street from where uh, they were. But the demographics changed and they didn't really realize that, hey, just we moved two blocks, but it's a completely different, different demographic. And I knew some of the pastors, they reached out. Can, can you talk to our leadership team, our pastoral team about uh, just ethnic reconciliation and and classism and, and the gospel and so start giving these talks and and lo and behold you know uh, ten years later well probably shorter than that maybe five or six years later I'm pastoring there and and now we have this book uh, what's neat is is not only was that my experience but Timothy Paul Jones who was just an experienced writer the co a friend of mine's the co-author. Yeah. And he was a friend of mine's when I was at Forest. He would come preach for me from time to time. He was one of my, mm. I didn't have him as a professor at uh, Southern Seminary where I went, but uh, out of the professors, he was one of the ones that I was closest to for various reasons. And, and so in 2018, um, I asked him to uh, give a talk at our uh, Sojourn Network, which is a church planning network is now called Harbor Network um, on this subject. And he gave a talk and uh, upon giving a talk, he's just like, hey, man, we should we should sit down and just outline a, a book together hmm. um, on this. And the Lord had put I had started writing, uh, taking those notes and actually writing a smaller book for our network pastors. And uh, we joined together. And this book um, is a lot better than uh, the first time I imagined it in the lectures I gave. And I think Timothy, if he was here, would say, too, it's uh, stronger as a result of us coming together. So, yeah, yeah. that's. It's significant and kind of symbolic that that you co-wrote this with uh, with a white dude. Yes, you know it's not like you went out to look for a white a token white dude to write this with, just to prove your point. Yeah. You no, know, it's just that the Lord yes. worked it out that way. Thanks be to God. Yes. You know, <laughs> so yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to write this book with a guy who I deeply respect, and uh, we came into this as friends. And we've heard of other co-authors writing books together, and they're not close friends afterwards. And uh, both Timothy and I feel like we became closer in writing this. And so, uh, and we love the way we did it. We kind of outlined uh, the book and, and wrote it on this theme of kind of liturgies and uh, uh, liturgy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and, uh, you know, yeah. I love, I, you had me at hello. <laughs> you had me at yes. hello. When I looked at the table of contents, mm -hmm. I opened up this book. I uh -huh. look at the table of contents. Yes. And I was like, what? Yeah. Yes, this this is exactly. That's <laughs> probably one of the reasons why. Uh, yeah, I think that it's so useful. Like I told you in an email, I I feel like it's a manual for worship, you know. But talk to me about how how did you come to structure it this way? Because yeah, I love that you structured it this way for so yes. many reasons. Well, and we can talk about all that, but it was really a, a God thing. Um, Timothy and I, as we were talking about the book, we're like, hey, next time we meet, let's sit down, let's talk about the structure and the theme. And so I show up, uh, Timothy has kind of started doodling about our, like Sojourner's Worship Services. Mm -hmm. He's like, I was thinking like, 
what if we followed our our worship services at, at Sojourn and um, it kind of followed the thinking of James K. Smith and others. And and I showed up with a book that I had just read um, by a guy who actually went a different direction with it, but it was on liturgies and racial reconciliation. And he kind of used the same, a similar model, but just towards ministries and not towards like a a worship service. So it was one of the, probably the biggest God moment, I think, in writing a book um, where we both kind of sit down. We've had this kind of seed germinating and uh, we're like, let's run with it. So this must be what the Lord has. And it also helped that uh, we wanted to honestly, in writing this book, our biggest burden was to be able to shepherd our own people Mm -hmm. and to help shepherd churches in our network. We said, Anyone outside of our church and our network that finds this helpful is like an addition. We want to write this for our church and churches like our church who are liturgical and um, who know the kind of importance of that. And so that's kind of the direction we ended up doing. Just really want to focus on habits because we know that our habits form our our loves, right? Yeah. And uh, we become what we behold. Yeah, and you are what you love. Habits and beholding. Yeah, yeah. And so it's it's been fun. I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit led us in this direction. That's kind of like my favorite thing about the work. Yeah, I I I recognize that I'm biased, you know. And uh, one of my friends was like, I was like, oh, I love that that this is structured liturgically. And he's like, what does that mean to you? And I'm like, I'm imagining what, how this is forming the, your church and how it's intended yes. to form churches into a place where, like I wrote, I wrote in the margins. Yeah. Where I, where I said, this is a manual for worship, worship <laughs> together and you will learn to get along. The liturgy yep. is and I don't even know if this is a real word, but the liturgy is the orthopractical solution to this, you know, orthopractic. Ooh, nice. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, it, yeah. I just made up a word. <laughs> um, you know, and so, so we submit ourselves to the liturgy and it's going to shape yeah. us into something. And so just the fact that you, that you took those ideas of how, when we worship, uh, we become what we worship and the things that we do in our worship service shape us and you get shape into the nitty gritty, you get all the way into the nitty gritty of the announcements, you know, you're yes. talking about the announcements yes. and how the announcements form us. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Yeah. well, how can this form us into a people who show no partiality? How can, yeah. how can this form us into a people who can practice communion uh, here yes. so that we can practice communion yes. everywhere. You know, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those practices and, and you're right. It's absolutely a, a worship issue. And this is what we see right in Galatians two with, with Paul, when he shows up and he's talking to Peter and just saying like, Hey man, table fellowship is important. This practice that you are sometimes taking uh, a part of, and sometimes not is important. In fact, it's so important. I'm going to say that this is a gospel. This has gospel implications, like mm. uh, not having table fellowship with your uh, Gentile brothers is, is speaking volumes about what you believe about the gospel. So I'm going to need you to go back to that table and uh, honor their uh, dignity as human beings and put this practice into place so that you are shaped into a person who doesn't fear the perception of others, but who fears God more and who welcomes all of his brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's a real liturgy that Paul was inviting him into, right? And that's what God is inviting us into. And uh, and we do that when, not just when we worship on Sunday, but how we live uh, by choosing to sometimes go out of our way and uh, to shop in a community that um, isn't homogenous or like our first culture or Mm -hmm. choosing to show up in certain ways to people that um, we could easily avoid, right? It it shapes us. So, yeah. Yeah. I think about the most diverse moment, at least in the autumn, the most diverse Mm -hmm. moment in the weekend in Philadelphia is around the liturgy of Eagles football. Those Eagles. Y'all been doing pretty good, man. Y'all got a little thing going. (laughs) Well, so worship, worship in Philadelphia on the weekends. And the, the, it is a beautiful example of how Mm -hmm. the Eagles football gathers 
every tongue, tribe, yes. and nation in this region yes. for for worship. And there are all sorts of liturgical mm-hmm. activities. I got a buddy, he and I talk about uh, the liturgical aspects of of football. Uh, a while back, there was a I-95, uh, a, a tanker uh, f- fell over or whatever and blew up part of I-95. And so when they repaired mm. I-95, there was a parade and the the Philadelphia sports mascots were part of that parade. And he and I had this long conversation wow. of like, what, how is that cultivating worship? You know, what, that yeah. is a liturgical yeah. thing that is cultivating worship. And, and it just kind of flies under the radar of everything. Cause everyone's like, Oh, that's yes. a normal thing. So uh, yeah. yeah, there's worship happening. Okay. So here's the problem. Here's the problem. You say y'all, <laughs> it, you can't say y'all I'm from Texas. I'm a Cowboys fan. I'm like, I'm like, oh, a, wow. I'm, I'm like a heretic around here. You know, it's, 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 it may be hard to be a Christian in Philadelphia. It's, it's yeah. really hard to be a Cowboys fan. <laughs> Here in Philadelphia. Yeah. Well, speaking of speaking of liturgies and football, I'll tell you what, I uh I'm a Bears fan. Uh, oh, okay. 85 Bears, greatest team ever. Can't believe we lost to the Dolphins. Could have had a perfect season. Uh, but anyway. Uh Those but were the days. for some reason, man, for some reason, I grew up a Buffalo Bills fan as well. That's my second team. I love Thurman Thomas, man. And uh so your your Dallas Cowboys uh habitually broke my heart as yeah. a kid. So <laughs> uh, those were the days. <laughs> but, it, but it is fascinating how this thing that is no. bigger than any one of us captures our yes. imaginations and we are enamored by it. And everyone, yeah. every tongue, tribe, and nation is enamored I'll by this that. thing. And this is a unifying thing in Philadelphia, you know. Mm-hmm. And so what yes. you're doing is you're going, you know, there's something better than football. There is someone yes. Mm-hmm. who has done something more glorious than than a perfect yeah. season you know um yes. <laughs> yes you know and there's all sorts of you know fun yeah. sermon lines from that but mm-hmm. but i think that that's what's so significant about about what you're doing is you're going mm-hmm. what we do on a sunday is way bigger than than we thought when it comes mm-hmm. to ra- racial conciliation racial reconciliation yeah. when it comes to yeah yeah uh doing what the end result is going to be every tongue tribe yeah. and nation worshiping yeah. at the feet of that's right of the lamb who is slain but is victorious yeah. you know anyway. yeah ethnic reconciliation is 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 beautiful and one of the things we talk about worship service and i we share a little bit about this in a book and how we kind of sojourn members were trying things were difficult and one of the breaking points for us was actually just modeling what a worship service could look like one day at, at midtown before we even were there was already not yet, like before it came to be. And uh, it was during the call of worship where we had people just read the same text in their uh, native tongue. And uh, and then we just had people sharing and, and song was just different. I remember that first service actually giving a visual. We went through our regular regular liturgical movements. And I just remember that being a powerful moment for a church and a handful of families and people came up afterwards that were on the fence and thinking about leaving. And mm-hmm. they're like, man, you giving us a visual of what this could look like mm-hmm. and um, showing us that there are people in our church who are giving up things and, and even language uh, to be here really makes me want to stay in the press into this a little more. And so that was that was a powerful Sunday for us. And sometimes what people need is just more than it, just us telling them is us to model it and mm-hmm. show this is what we're what we're talking about. And this is what could one day be, because sometimes our imaginations are just stunted from being able to see that possibility because we're so used to um, our comfort zones and what we're used to. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so I like that we started there uh, with kind of like this is how glorious it could be you know Mm -hmm. i like that we started there because like i said earlier all right just to be honest man what you what you propose uh in the book and what i have seen in my pastoral ministry with with friends in in pastoral ministry who are trying to do multi-ethnic uh multicultural Mm -hmm. uh church is it's just hard, you know, it's, it's difficult. Mm-hmm. It's been discouraging to see, to mm-hmm. see people struggle, to see uh, both mm-hmm. where it's like, there are black pastors that I know that would love for 
uh, more white people to come to their church and are trying to figure out how to make that happen. There are white pastors that I know that are trying to get more uh, mm -hmm. black and brown yeah. uh, people to come to their church. So that it's like, well, how do I make mm -hmm. this happen? You know, and so and, I, and I've seen a lot of churches just kind of crumble under the weight of trying to make yeah. this happen and just everybody's yes. mad. And so everyone just like, I'm out. You know, or one of the pastors, yes. if it's yeah. like co-led, one of the pastors is like, I can't do this anymore. I'm out. I've seen that a number mm -hmm. of times, mm -hmm. you know, so just absolutely. All right. So what's the, what's the hope? Like, like preach me hope, pastor. <laughs> well, I'll just say this, you know, my pastors and I, we say multi-ethnic pro uh, churches have multi-ethnic problems. Mm. And, um, you know, you don't go into multi-ethnic ministry and look for this kind of ethnic reconciliation without thinking that it's going to be spiritual warfare. It's going to be spiritual mm. warfare. And right. I think to another level, especially here in North America, where there's just a, a stronghold in this nation as it comes to just racial and ethnic issues and justice issues. And so one, if you don't feel a call towards it and you're not absolutely sure that the Lord has called you to, to do that, I, I would say don't. Uh, two, if you haven't done your own gospel identity work, ethnic work, and cross-cultural work, then you shouldn't be leading a multi-ethnic church. I tell people that all the time to uh, you know, white brothers that I, I love dearly um, who have never submitted to black or brown leadership, um, who don't have black friends, brown friends. I'm like, hey, man, you're just not ready uh, to lead a multi-ethnic church. Uh, now, I and every church isn't called to be a multi-ethnic church. There are some scenarios and situations where it's just not wise. You know, even at Forest uh, Baptist, because of where she was is located, nestled in a very historic Black community, when we started having white seminary families come and things like that, I started getting a little uncomfortable because some of these families were coming with these expectations that it's like, no, you're, you're trying to impose, even mm -hmm. without knowing it, and you're pressuring for this church to become something that it's not going to come and it's not healthy for it to become this is uh, because of where it's located because of who was in the community and you may have some uh you know uh, first generation or even second generation korean churches where it's just probably wise for them to continue that fellowship with that said every church is called to cultivate what we call a multi-ethnic kingdom culture mm, okay yeah and what a multi-ethnic kingdom culture yeah is a culture in a context where People have a gospel rooted identity that transcends and simultaneously appreciates um, their ethnic um, cultures and that which in, from their ethnic cultures is true, good and beautiful. Right. Can you, can you give so me a specific church, story? Yeah. So essentially what I'm saying is every church should be cultivating a hospital, uh, a hospitable environment where when people come through the door, they feel like I don't have to check my ethnic identity at the door to be well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I don't, you know, I don't have to dress in mm -hmm. this particular way or I don't have to necessarily agree with the, uh, the way the schooling culture of this church. I don't have to, you know, I don't, I'm not, we're not adding things to the gospel. We're not adding things to the Christian life that makes it difficult for people to come in simply because culturally this is not what they're used to. Yeah. And so that's creating space for people to be who they are. Right. And that was the same thing even with, uh, with Forrest. I remember when I first started pastoring there, historic African-American church, everyone was dressed to the nines. Uh, we were an older church, uh, and that was so much good, so much history behind that and reasons, rationality behind why the Black church does that, and I, I love dressing up. But we started having cats from the street and from the hood come mm. with fitted hats and jeans. I'm witnessing other young guys are witnessing to guys on the block. They're starting to come. And um, as soon as they walk through the door, you know, there's a finger wagging. Them deacons are getting them. Take your hat off. pull up, And it's like, hey, Deke, I know what y'all trying to do, but we want to create a culture where we care more about the person who has the clothes on than the clothes themselves. Like oh, that's so good. Don't. Right? And that's kind of that, that culture. We, you know, we want, we want to give people space and, 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 and time and allow them to not have unnecessary things. Alive, right. 
That's beautiful. And so that's what we mean by that. Yeah. My, and, my, uh, and every church yeah, can do that. So I'm thinking even for the rural or suburban homogenous church, the way you do that as a pastor of, uh, or as leaders is reading church history and not just from like your ethnic perspective, like learning stories from other ethnicities and their missionaries and implementing that in your sermons yeah. so that people know like, hey, our ethnicity is isn't the only one that's like historically been doing things for the kingdom of God because you want to preach in such a way where those kids, when they grow up and they go to college, um, they have a global perspective and they see the gospel as a, a, a global gospel, right? A significant paradigm shift for me was uh, a very close, dear black pastor friend of mine. Mm-hmm. I said, hey man, what could I do to make my my church what are some of the things I can do to make my church more hospitable to guests who are people of color? And mm-hmm. he goes, you know, when I go into your church, I don't want to feel like a welcome guest. I want to feel at mm-hmm. home. Yes. And I was like, oh, oh, yeah. yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. It's a totally different paradigm. Mm-hmm. And, I, it and, and so. when it, yeah. it hit me and I was like, yeah, this is your home. I don't want you to feel like a mm-hmm. guest here. I want you to feel at mm-hmm. home here. What do I need to do to make you yes. feel at home here? That's a different type of question. And for us at Sojourn, when we first started on this journey, um, man, that meant we had to rethink some of the pictures that were visible when guests first came. So we're, we want people from the community to come in. And and uh, the church uh, was a cathedral, Catholic cathedral from uh you know, the 1800s. And so when you come in, there's this older picture selling the story, which is beautiful. But to a black black person that's in a neighborhood already stepping into a all white space and all the pictures you see on the wall are all white people and black and white, you know, like some things you just have to think through and just say like, oh, OK, so maybe that won't be the first thing we see. Maybe it's just a welcome sign. Right. And uh, so you just start thinking through those things. What could Give someone pause to say, like, am I really welcomed here? If yeah. everything around all our artifacts are saying that I'm not, even if it's not intentional. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's not intentional. It's like it's become invisible. That's the architecture. Yes. That surrounds yes. us that has been shaping us. It's it's yes. invisible to us. And it's not until it's someone comes out, comes from out, outside and goes, oh, that's that's an interesting thing. You notice that no one around here looks yeah. like me. Does anybody notice yeah. that? And people are like, yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. Yeah. wow. Yeah. So I'm going to put my cynical hat on just with things that I've experienced, you know? And so tell me, tell me what you think about some of these things. Um, yeah. Talk to me about the token black pastor, the token white pastor mm-hmm. or the token, whatever absolutely. deacon, the token mm-hmm. elder. That's one that I've struggled with. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's just the human heart. You know, John says the lust of the eye, lust of flesh, pride of life. Like we all have those temptations. And as leaders, we have those temptations. Jesus hits those temptations in the wilderness uh, head on. Right. The lust of the uh, uh, eye, lust of flesh, pride of life. Each of those temptations, Satan's temptation kind of can fall under that, those categories. So the same way as with ministry leaders, like we feel this burden. We want a diverse church and we can just start lusting for it and we can start trying to make it happen in our Mm. own strength rather than doing it in a measured and a wise way. Tokenism is horrible. Mm. It is dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's my biggest fear, even in writing this book, it's my biggest fear that some person will pick up this book and just say, Hey man, we've got to find a black leader like soldier and get, and we've got to put them in a leadership position. And this is how we start. And it's like, no, that's not where we start. And that's not what necessarily needs to happen. What needs to happen is to be curious about who's in our community already. Mm-hmm. Um, and for us to um, think about how to wisely cross those cultures so that we can share the gospel with them. And what can we control in the healthiest way possible so that if they were to come on a Sunday, they could say, man, I'm welcome here. And I can see myself here long term, right? 
Um, so yeah, tokenism is 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 really dehumanized. A lot I know a lot of people who have been tokenized. I've been tokenized, not not at Sojourn uh, necessarily, but in the past, and it just doesn't doesn't feel good. So how do you avoid that? Um, and one thing I loved about Sojourn pastors when we came in, that was one of the first questions, like, how is this not tokenism? Mm. And I was like, hey, man, I'm not an expert on tokenism, but it would be tokenism if you're calling me to be a lead pastor. Um, but I don't have a, any the, the same authority as the last white lead pastor had, the same expectations as the last white lead pastor has if you lower a standard so that I could come in or if you are all of a sudden not giving me the same responsibility because you don't think I can I can uh, keep a standard or reach a standard or suddenly you're taking away things because you don't want me to have that power over you that's tokenism so I said what that looks like for me is one is uh preach um as the lead pastor who's over preaching and vision you know, like I should be able to oversee um, our preaching calendar and submit that to elders to to speak into. Um, I should be able to speak into staff culture, who we hire, how we hire, and our hiring process, just like any other lead pastor. Vision, I should have the responsibility of helping with the team cultivate that and um, and submitting that to elders so they can review. And, and so the way you don't tokenize is by, by making sure that people have the responsibility, accountability, and authority that they would have had if it wasn't for their their ethnic uh, makeup. Yeah, that's really wise. Here's another one that I've wrestled with. Um, you know, what is the role of a white lead pastor in a multi ethnic space? You know, yeah, I, I, I've right. I've seen that too. You know, that's a and that's a difficult mm-hmm. space. So, like, talk about that. I've seen, and I know some white pastors in multi ethnic space that, that that do a great job. We've got plenty in the Harbor Network. Um, I know of of several, and I think for the white pastors in a multi ethnic space, it's just making sure that he is uh, cultivating those gospel qualities, uh, like every pastor should, but humility that he remains curious as well, and that he can um, identify areas where being white and a part of the majority may be impacting uh, or impeding upon um, other uh, ethnicities, uh, being able to to speak into just the way worship is done um, at the church and uh, the rhythms of the church. And the same is true uh, even when it comes to just classism, racism is a, a huge thing, but I think classism is just as big of an issue, if not even bigger. So we have to constantly slow down and ask ourselves, like, man, what am I bringing into this that could be uh, showing partiality or keeping people from just being free in the Lord? Yeah. One of the- and empowering non-white leaders is really important, too. Yeah. Yeah. Empowering non-white leaders, having systems and structures in place where non-white leaders um, are being poured into and uh, given a chance to to lead and to lead um, in a way that's most natural to them as well as effective. Yeah, that's really good. One of the things you said in, in I think it was chapter 11 of your book, it's a, the whole colorblindness thing and, and how let's get beyond this, you know, to where uh, we can celebrate, where we, we can celebrate different uh, ethnicities yeah, yeah. Uh, we we like to say uh, we're not, you know, colorblind. We're also not color uh, bound. We're color blessed, mm. right? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, having a certain amount of melanin in our skin doesn't make us more righteous um, right. than than the next person, and that's what a lot of secular philosophies um, are doing. It's almost like a flip of the table to the point that now the oppressed become can become the oppressor or just becomes this unequal, weird, shaming thing. As my pastor friend uh, Jarvis Williams likes to say, man, like uh, white guilt is not a fruit of the spirit. Right. And yeah. um, and so Dude, so we've got to deal it, with that reality. Yeah, mm-hmm. I read uh, when I read uh, Stamp from the beginning, I was just like, yes. uh, I don't even know what to do with myself. Like I. Yeah. You know, yeah. And so. So you, what your yeah. your take your take of like, I love it. It's the night. It's you're not sitting on the fence. It's this yeah. is breaking down yeah. the fence and saying, mm-hmm. uh, no, actually Jesus is calling us to something better, yeah. as in heaven, so here. 
in the mm-hmm. church, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. We want to appreciate. Yeah, that's what that's what we talk about, multi-ethnic kingdom cultures, culture where we have this tri- transcendent identity in Jesus. And that is our, our gospel identity. But that gospel identity allows us to appreciate our own ethnic identities, right? Without ethnocentrism, mm. um, but to have a, a healthy, this is how God made me. And I want to enjoy what's good, true, and beautiful of how he made me. And um, and I don't want to, you know, yeah. So that's what we're trying to do, and and uh, and help people to reject both color blindness as well as secular uh, anti racism, uh, specific things that's not uh, true truth out of them. Mm. Thankful for the observations, grateful right. for the history of mm-hmm. some of what we learn, but also understanding that at the end of the day, that framework breaks down. And um, and it won't sanctify and it won't unify. Yeah, that that is hopeful. That is very hopeful. You know, I, when I read uh, a lot of the anti-racist or anti-racism stuff, I'm like, I feel stuck, you know, and you're like, hey, you don't feel stuck. You don't feel, feel stuck. So I just appreciate that, you know. Um, well, thank you. All right. So yeah. all right, one more one more question. Uh, we're kind of coming uh-huh. to our time. Paint me a picture. Maybe use Sojourn Midtown as an example of your hopes for them. Uh, But, Mm -hmm. you know, feel free to make it as big as you want, you know, your dreams for Mm -hmm. what could the next three to five years, what would you love to see? What do you hope to see over the next three to five years? Yeah. Thank you. I think at the end of the day, it sounds simple, but it's just us to live out those great commandments, loving the Lord God with all your heart, mind and soul and loving your neighbors yourself, man. If we can get people to, uh, just truly allow God's love to um, to flow through them and then be conduits of that love in a way that is hopeful and healthy and and welcoming and curious mm. and empowering, uh, then we've done our job. And I think that the natural result of that will be uh, what we see in the early church, the first three centuries of, of Christianity, where we just see the church just living so beautifully in Rome, breaking down all of these different affinities and stereotypes and they're just a fellowship of of difference together confusing everybody because they're like man you follow the way you follow jesus you follow the resurrected one more particularly at 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 midtown i'm just praying that we just don't get distracted by the spirit of the age Mm. We stay the course, as Paul told Timothy in what Second Timothy chapter four, that we will put on a sober mindedness, right, or self control. That uh, that we would do the work of an evangelist, right? That um, that we would just fulfill our ministry. Um, and an even more granular level, our hope is that we would just start raising up more elders um, uh, from various ethnic communities in our church to not only represent those ethnic communities, but to speak into the life of our church at a more um, from a holistic level. So that's really what we're praying for and focusing on is that every a major uh, ethnic group or, or people that, that are coming to our church and are coming more, that we'll be able to identify spirit uh, led man to lead and spirit led men and women as deacons to lead those ministries as well. Yeah, that's really good. Like I said, I, I've experienced the discouragement in all of these things. Yeah. And I want to hear you describe Jesus' okay. posture toward the pastor who's discouraged, the elder, the deacon who's fumbling, the, the, the white dude who tries to do something and he gets blamed for being woke, uh, who gets blamed yeah. for doing something else and, who gets, uh, and, and he's called a racist. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the black pastor who's, or, or the Latin American pastor or whatever. And there's just discouragement. Yeah. Like, so, so speak into like, what is Jesus yeah. posture toward that person? What does Jesus say to that yeah. person? Yeah, I think Jesus posture is a, a bruised reed. He will not break and a smoldering wick. He will not put out. And I would say, uh, do not grow weary in doing well. For you will receive your reward if you faint not, right? And so don't let weary win. Um, Remember the power of if. Um, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pay. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, where will I be? If you faint not 
And the good thing is, is if you're looking at Jesus and holding on to him, he will uh, complete the good work that he started in you. So just rest in him and stop. Don't try to make it happen. Just Mm. put your eyes on Jesus be curious, learn from your, your lessons. You know, uh, what Lecrae say, man, it's not a loss. It's a lesson. Like yeah. learn from them. If you, if you make a mistake, you know, somebody once said, man, for times where you do stuff that's stupid and it come off as racism, man, remember racism. Like oh. you're not the first to blow it. Peter blew it too. Yeah. And create a church in which people don't expect you to have it all together because they know you're a sinner like them and you lead with your weak foot forward and make sure they know, Hey man, I'm chief of all sinners. I will offend you. I will say stuff that doesn't sit right. If you could be gracious to let me know and give me time to ponder it and think on it and to uh, see uh, what I can own and, and may need to own. And, and then if we agree to disagree, you know, cause I, some things is not going to be me. It's going to be, maybe you've been too sensitive or, your own story or perspectively now. But yeah. what Jesus wants you to hear is uh, that he has rest for you. He has so much rest for you, so much love for you. And he's not asking you to be Superman or Superwoman. He's just asking you to be faithful. And congratulations, you're already part of a, a multi-ethnic church. And she is doing really well. She may be struggling right now in America because all the political and racial unrest. She may be struggling because it seems like persecution is coming. But man, she is growing in very hard places right now. And uh, and one day she'll be around Jesus' throne, worshiping Jesus. And, uh, and all will be well. So just keep going. Don't give up. Stay faithful. Hey Amen. That's so good. I, yeah, I really appreciate that. It, it, it is encouraging and it is so full of hope. You, you're creating a context where grace abounds, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. let grace abound in these, well, you know, the podcast is called Grace at the Fray. Let, let grace abound mm-hmm. in these frayed yeah. edges uh, of life. Yes. So thank you so much, man. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. you coming on. You're welcome. My joy. Let's call this what it is. Race issues are a special kind of stronghold in American culture. A missionary may go into a different culture and as an outsider, with the help of the Holy Spirit, they can begin to see the strongholds of power that are at work in a culture. So it is important that we realize that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but that powers and principalities of evil are at work in our culture. The spirits of evil that hate us and feast on our discord. But there's hope. Like Jamal said, congratulations, you are already a part of a multi-ethnic church, and she is doing just fine. And her destiny is more glorious than we can fathom. In fact, the gates of hell will not stand against the onslaught of God's kingdom of grace. And that's what we were made to participate in. So let me give you one more emphatic recommendation. Go read Jamal's book, In Church As It Is In Heaven. If you're a pastor or a worship leader, this is a manual for Sunday worship. Learn how to worship together and you will learn how to get along. It's our destiny as God's people. So we might as well start now. I'll have a link for his book in the show notes, as well as other discipleship resources that we at Surge love to provide. Discipling others into the life of grace that we have been given is a fundamental part of who we are as a missions organization. If you're discipling others and looking to grow your discipleship skills, I recommend checking out our free email course on one key aspect of discipleship, active listening. This free course will give you practical tools to develop your listening skills and and to help others grow deeper with Jesus. Go to surge.org slash active dash listening to sign up for that. And as always, if you can, leave a five-star rating of this podcast on iTunes, like and subscribe on our YouTube channel, and think of five friends to share this episode with. And if you like this podcast or any of the multitude of things Surge is doing around the world, God's world, consider giving. Go to surge.org slash give. And now I want to close the way Jamal and Timothy closed their book by quoting a blessing written by Jason Stevens. 
We began this expedition with a call to worship, and we'll end with a benediction, which is simply a blessing for the road, a plea for God's favor on mission, to mobilize the whole body, no omissions, even a crossroads positioned between neighborhoods forbidden, a plea to turn roadblocks into crossroads, the path to inroads is often the road less traveled. So this blessing is contingent upon the decision to allow our backs to be places where crosses road. So let's call this benediction the Via Dolorosa Commission. We don't ride alone, but we'll ride or die in our commitment. Because the destination is one in which we must close our eyes to see. And prayerfully, our eyes have been opened, so you know why we should plead. For God to give us a glimpse of the promised people pictured at the end of time, we read, Behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the king, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and together they will sing. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And if this is how a glorified people give glorious worship to a glorious God in his presence, your will in heaven down to earth will you bring? To us, so let it be. Through us, oh, let it be. Even now, God, let us see. And if there are any other witnesses here who would agree, turn your palms and your hearts to the sky in a posture to receive. May grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to learn, give, and grieve, to love, strive, believe, to overcome the divisive one, and everyone he's deceived. Mercy to know you're loved. Mercy for times you've faltered. Mercy for future stumbles. Mercy that you will offer. Peace for troubled souls. Peace that perseveres. Peace that binds pieces together. Finding its heart in the bosom of the Father who is near. In the name of the Holy One. Let this peace, let this peace let this peace be with you. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to smile down on you. May the Lord be gracious to you and turn his bright eyes to you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>